Welcome back, everybody. <laughs> Ladies and germs, my next guest is a Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist and author of the books War on Peace and Catch and Kill. Please welcome back to The Late Show, Ronan Farrow. <laughs> How long has it been since I've had you here in person, kiddo? Pre-pandemic, we've been doing the Zoom. Pre-pandemic, like well, everyone, we... we've been locked in our Zoom. Oh, we did Christmas. talk in the Zoom, yeah. yeah, a couple times. Yeah, but this uh, is better. This is Hi, much everyone. better. Yes. This is a lot better. Yeah. I like the suit. Thank you so much. It's very nice. It's got a '70s vibe, especially the open collar. I feel little, like I'm Dick Cavett. A little, little pink for pride. Now it has been <laughs> a, a tough time uh, to cover the news, and uh, you've EP'd a new HBO documentary called In. Endangered that chronicles, chronicles the temporary hostil the contemporary hostility toward journalists around the world, including the United States. What what made you want to make this now? Well, I, I think that for anyone who does confronting journalism, we feel very acutely what happens to our peers, our colleagues around the world when they try to do the same. And like I'm in a country still to this day that has decent rule of law, relatively speaking, to other places, where, you know, I might be surveilled, I might get intimidating legal threats, there might be smear efforts, but, but I am reasonably confident I'm not going to wind up dead the next day. And that's not true if you're a journalist in Russia, if you're a journalist in Pakistan, a lot of places. So it felt important to me to do something that I'm, I'm not in, but that humanizes that struggle for people around the world, and specifically people in democracies, doing reporting that's really important to bring us the facts and create accountability, and facing threats that uh, would have been unthinkable in those countries not that long ago. But you also include the United States yeah. in the document. Yeah, so it's, it looks at the forces in the United States that are eroding our base of journalism and facts that voters can rely on. You know, economic challenges for the news industry that are causing closures of newsroom after newsroom. Uh, a, a fascist and authoritarian thread in politics that seeks to demonize and alienate uh, the, the press from the, the people? The previous president said uh, very specifically that he wanted to address the freedom of the press so that a journalist could be sued for libel more easily. And you see in this film, there's a, a wonderful photographer from the Miami Herald who's contending with both of those things at the same time, you know, wading into the crowds, facing even the threat of violence. We've seen that in, in crowds um, at some of these MAGA events in recent years. Uh, and enemy of the people. And enemy of the people. And that is, that is not a new thing. That is an old tactic used by authoritarian leaders. And we are seeing it resurge around the world, including in the countries that we look at in this film. And that's, that's scary, because that, that's not an incidental issue. That underpins every major issue related to our rights and freedoms. If you don't have the facts, you can't create accountability. Democracy dies in darkness, as someone once yeah, said. Yeah, yeah, there was something to that. Yeah. Now, yeah. I I'm curious. You might... I'm wondering whether you've got a sort of a, a theory of the case here, because um, I, at one time, was thinking that our previous president was sort of an aberration, almost like a mutant we didn't expect in, you know, in the lineage of our, of our uh, presidents. But this authoritarian tendency is arising, certainly, in every hemisphere, if not in every time zone. What is your theory of the case of why this is happening so much now? I, I think it is integrally linked to this issue of the free press. And it all starts, you know, there's a number of factors, but I think it, it does all start in a way with the facts that people have. And the economic forces that are creating what people sometimes call news deserts around the United States, mm -hmm. so many communities that just don't have a paper of record anymore, don't have a local paper at all. It, it's in the rise of social media, mm -hmm. where people can live in a little bubble of their own facts that they already agree with where people can, can hear phrases like fake news and it can resonate with them because all they're getting every day is that drumbeat. And then that, those two things together, the news desert, desert and the social media, makes kind of kills local news and makes every story a national story or all concerns national concerns. Which is a tragedy on multiple levels, right? Because there's urgent policy concerns at a local level in communities and, and local reporters, both in TV and print, are still out there struggling to do really important work, but there's less and less of it, not what we need in it. And 
And I did a lot of reporting on the January 6th rioters and identified a, a bunch of those individuals. And you know, those conversations reinforced to me, we need more and better reporting in communities around this country. We need to support our journalists. Otherwise, we are going to have people who are in this state of rage and who are very manipulable by these political leaders who want to deploy these authoritarian arguments. We have a clip here. You, you talk about the, 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 the loss of local news, local newspapers. We have a clip here with, which deals with that. Who is this doing this interview here on the street? Uh, th this is this is a Guardian reporter named uh, Ollie. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a, a wonderful journalist, and he had to wade uh, kind of through through hell and back in this film. You'll you'll see, Jim. So the paper in Youngstown, The Vindicator, closed down recently, meaning that Youngstown is now the biggest city in America without a local newspaper. Were you upset by that? No, it's just a sign of the times. They're a dying industry because they are so left-wing progressives. We are not left-wing progressives. So we stopped buying the newspaper. We stopped them just having one point of view, the Democrats. Why am I going to pay for a paper that calls me all kinds of names because I'm a conservative Republican? That's why they're a dying industry. Don't you think, though, that the, this community has a right to have accountability journalism in it, though? Because that's what that, the function of that paper was. It was to hold the powerful to account. No, I don't, I don't believe they did. I'm not going to buy a newspaper that doesn't reflect my views. So this is, this is central to the problems we're talking about. This is, I think, when we have basic rights ripped away from us, a lot of the time, one of the, the core things underpinning that is the, the facts we have as a, as a public, as an electorate, and who we bring in, sometimes due to a lack of the facts penetrating. And you, you see over and over again in, in his particular journey, there's four characters who are dealing with different trend lines and how it impacts their personal lives. And, and his journey is a lot about wading through that kind of misinformation culture. Well, on a lighter subject, <laughs> You, 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 Good you, turn. You, well, that's, they pay me for the segues. <laughs> um, you write books, you report for The New Yorker, you've got projects on Audible and HBO, but I want to talk a, a, about a project you were involved with uh, fairly recently. Uh, you were a judge on RuPaul's Drag Race. <laughs> Season 7. <laughs> I was. How would, you, how would you compare this responsibility to some of the other jobs that you've done? I mean, one of my toughest assignments... And I, look, I wanted to do okay so badly. I hope the Drag Race diehards, uh, you know, are, are kind to me. I had been asked before. Rue was very gracious in, in wanting me on some years ago. And, and the first time I was booked on the show, it was uh, October 2017. I was a little busy at the time. I um, I was working on a story about Harvey Weinstein. And I was, you know, getting some of these tactics that we've been talking about, the journalists face, you know, legal intimidation. And I mm -hmm. wasn't eating. I wasn't sleeping. I was being followed around. And it was this existential giant thing that the editors at The New Yorker were working on, I was working on, and I, I did go to them at the 11th hour and say, hey, I know we're running this story on this day, this exact day, but can I leave to judge a drag pancake-making competition? <laughs> and they looked at me like I was completely insane and said, no. <laughs> so I was so honored to be asked back, and I, I was so excited to do it. And, and boy, they're great queens on this season. I mean, they're all winners, and the things you're, you're going to see fashion-wise on this episode that I did, I mean, it blew my mind. Can everyone be a winner, though? Don't you have to judge who the winner is? Well, it's, they're picking a winner amongst winners. It's very complicated politics, Stephen. Ronan, thank you so much it's for being here. pleasure, Stephen. And yeah. thank you for always defending the free press. The, the Woodward and Bernstein episode, uh, the way that you constantly are part of that drumbeat, we need it right now. Nice of you to say. Thank you for being the free press. The HBO documentary film, In Danger, debuts tomorrow on HBO and HBO Max. It's Ronan Farrow, everybody. We'll be right back.